Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Gary Neville podcast. We're speaking on the gantry at Anfield after the goalless draw between the two great rivals, the champions and the challengers who are leading the table. That's why you're smiling. And, of course, we are talking before Manchester City play Crystal yeah. Palace. We'll get that in at the start. <clears throat> so what have we made of a game that, that was never dull, but in the end didn't quite fire to life? No, it didn't. And I think if you said to both managers before the game, where are your risks? Ole Gunnar Solskjaer would have said that front three. Uh, are always a risk and Liverpool could make a real statement today having been fired up by the fact that United have gone above them and I think if you see Jurgen Klopp you just said that you know we're playing Henderson and Fabinho at centre-back and United have got Cavani, Rashford, Greenwood, Martial and in the end I think they've maybe concentrated it looked like a game where both teams were aware of their risks they dealt with those risks brilliantly mm, their both, weaknesses their the parents, weaknesses yeah. yeah and they dealt with their weaknesses brilliantly and both teams defended well but forgot about the fact that the, the game was there really to win um, I'm not disappointed from a Manchester United point of view, and I don't think Jurgen Klopp will be overly disappointed from a Liverpool point of view because I think it tells he'll know where his team are at at this moment in time. Well, let's start with Liverpool, yeah, um, because they're defending and trying to win the title again, and you know how difficult you've done it back to back yeah. titles. Three games in the Premier League now without scoring, and that had that happened since uh, our friend Jamie Carragher was stopping goals, but they weren't scoring at the other end back in 2005. And that's odd for a team. With the, are, are the front three getting found out by the defences of the Premier League? Not found out. I wouldn't say that they're getting found out. Maybe sometimes it's not just the obvious. It can It can be just maybe a little bit below form. It can also be that the rest of the team isn't just functioning as well as it should do. Um, but looking at Liverpool at this moment in time, I expected them to... I, mean, I, I, des I described them as they're going to come out like animals before the game. I thought in that first half an hour, they didn't come out quite like animals, but they were certainly strong. And I think the minute that they got past that 25, or the, the moment they got past that 25 minutes, Jurgen Klopp will have thought, this is going to be a struggle. Because the same th type of patterns were emerging that, you know, Firmino looked like he was struggling in front of goal. Mane and Salah weren't getting the chances. Uh, Thiago started the game for well for 15, 20 minutes. But yeah, let, let's talk about him because yeah. it's his first Anfield yeah. appearance in a Liverpool shirt. And obviously he's been built up hugely with some justification. How, how did he do? He's a hell of a player. I mean, we've seen him for many years and you could see he's a hell of a player in that game. And for the first 15, 20 minutes, I was thinking, why is Bruno not just going standing on him? Because he's really running the game. And you said it, I think he's running the game. He's having such an influence, not just with his passing, but he was dribbling past people. He looked like he was the man on the pitch and then all of a sudden this sort of uh, influence just waned and it just went less towards half time but I would say that was a pretty good uh, debut at Anfield in a, in, a, in a tough game against Manchester United Manchester United midfield are dogged in McTominay and Fred uh, Fernandes obviously is a very good player they had Pogba tucking in as well so I don't think it was the easiest game for him but he certainly he can play in any game in the world Thiago and he has played in all the games in the world um, so I think he'll be a uh, I just think him in there with Fabinho and Henderson is a, di a completely different proposition. Let's say Liverpool's best two midfield players, or most uh, powerful midfield players and influential midfield players, are playing centre back today, which obviously meant that with in front with Shakiri and Wijnaldum, Wijnaldum's a very good player. It was just not the same rhythm. They weren't the same Liverpool. It wasn't didn't have the same cohesion. And I mean, that may be what's causing the front three a problem. And the fact that the fullbacks are not getting the, the record-breaking assists from no. Trent Alexander-Arnold and Andy Robertson up to a point, but it's just slowed down recently. It has. They're not playing at probably... I think it's unfair on Robertson, actually, because Robertson just is so consistent. <laughs> Trent isn't at the same... Some of the deliveries that he would put has been putting in for the last couple of years been out of this world and you're just thinking wow what is this this is not a fullback as I know it and I played it <laughs> um, but he's just not quite he's having a little bit of a dip but that's understandable I, I, I looked at City last season I wasn't overly critical of them because the levels they'd reached for a couple of years were off the scale and there is bound to be that little bit of a dip and Liverpool have been like this now for three years a million miles an hour two Champions League finals one Champions League victory then a league title this, plus the coronavirus no fans in the stadium and the energy in this stadium comes from the fans there's bound to be that little bit of a dip so I don't think I can sit here and be overly critical of any Liverpool player certainly the front three or Trent Alexander-Arnold or, or, or Andy Robertson but they're just not quite at the level they're not at the level and that's why we see Leicester second in the league Manchester United at the top it's why we see such an interesting season because of what's happening Liverpool and City absolutely have stunned us for the last two years with their consistent or three years sorry with their consistency we'll never see that title race I think it was a couple of years ago when City won 
and I think that City got 100 points and Liverpool were up there with 98, whatever they got. We'll never see that again, I don't think. That was a level and a standard that I've never seen before and won eight Premier League titles, but it was unbelievable in terms of consistency and brilliance. We're now watching a normal league. You know, 75, 80 points, 85 points, we'll probably win it. Um, and that's what we would see in an ordinary season. But it's better for us as a sort of watching and a spectacle. And to see United at the top is fantastic. It's allowed Manchester United yeah. to be in there, hasn't it? Because the, the, it has. hasn't been the, they're not capable, perhaps, of getting those 40-odd no. points at this stage. But they are top. So describe them in your mind, how we find them. They've, it's a good point for them. They're still top of the table. Little surprise for themselves, maybe, at this stage as well? Definitely surprised. Every Manchester United fan is having a good time. Because to say that, you know, if you said eight weeks ago, ten weeks ago, that uh, Manchester United would be top of the league in January, you just said no chance. Not a chance. The, the, the performance levels weren't there. Inconsistent, going out of Europe. Um, but then, through the inconsistency in the performances away from home in the first half, but then winning in the second half and coming out on top, has given them a resilience and a spirit, and it's starting to get better. And I thought that was, that was a pretty good performance from Manchester United today. I'm, I'm torn a little bit because I'm disappointed a little bit because I thought it was there for the taking. I think Manchester United fans at home that still got the sort of Sir Alex Ferguson period in their memory will think we should have gone for them. They were there for the taking. But actually, that's a big step forward if you think about where Manchester United have been in this last two or three years because they came here, they managed the game well, they were controlled. I never thought they really looked in too much doubt. They had the best two chances in the last 15 minutes with Pogba and Fernandes and could have won the game and then you would have said it was a brilliant performance and here has always been a nightmare to play I, you, I said at half time nil nil's okay at half time here because I've never played here and won a game by half time you always have to go into the last five ten minutes and you then might go and sort of score and get a counter-attack goal and you might get another one then but and the game might, might look easy but it never is this is the toughest place to play for Manchester United they've not lost here for nearly four years in April this year which is a mesmerizing uh, record so I can't sit here as a disappointed Manchester United fan I'm not I think I'm quite proud that they're, they're at the level that they're at and that we're talking about the fact that we might be a little bit disappointed they didn't just go and win the game in the end I think that's where Ollie will be at but had they done that and then lost the game of course you the, the air comes out of the balloon then doesn't it it, it was important with, with two or three minutes to go that Liverpool didn't go and score and then I think Ollie would have been accused of not going for it why didn't you go and you know go for them because they were there for the taking why didn't Greenwood come on earlier and move Pogba into the middle. Why didn't you make the attacking substitutions earlier? It, it, that would have come, but that's natural. That's the nature of the game. But I must admit, there was a point with 15, 20 minutes to go where, you know, I was a manager for a short period of time and you've been on that touchline for a long time, Martin. And I, not, I didn't feel for the manager, but I, thought, I understood the difficulty that they both had. Jurgen Klopp's looking at a game and thinking... This has got danger written all over it. We could get done here. That's why I asked Jamie Carragher in commentary, would you take a draw here? Because my feeling was that Jurgen Klopp was thinking, actually, this has got more danger on it than, it. you know, the, the risk of going for it is great because we'll probably end up losing the game. And I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer had that same predicament that actually we're going to get one or two chances. I think we'll get one or two chances and we could win it. But if I go with Greenwood on the right and we become a bit loose, they could go and win it and Robertson could get clear. And though it's January and we're thinking like we normally do in January, that we're moving towards the latter stage of the season, of course, we're not even halfway yet. So no, no. any error of judgment in that respect. Talk about Pogba because you said some very interesting things about him at the start of the game when you, you was pick a close up and you picked him. Uh, just revisit that for us. Yeah. I I think Manchester United's chances of winning this league are slim. I think that Manchester City and Liverpool are still the best two teams in the league and that Manchester United will, f at some point, hopefully not, but they'll go to third. Um, if it goes to form and it goes to sort of what everybody would think at the start of the season and even now. But the slim chance that they have of winning the league will depend upon, I think, something like Paul Pogba delivering a cameo two or three, four months of brilliance, which he's capable of. You know, going scoring there in the last five, ten minutes, which he could have done, and winning the game would have obviously, I think, you know, go from Burnley on Tuesday where he scores the winner, or Wednesday, sorry, he scores the... Tuesday, Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday. scores the winner, and then comes to Anfield and scores the winner. All of a sudden, there's just a momentum building. And I thought it was tough for him today. I thought it was tough for him because I've seen it over the years. I played at Manchester United, and I saw at times that Sir Alex Ferguson had to put Wayne Rooney out on that right-hand side. He had to put Danny Welbeck out on that right-hand side. 
And it's not easy when you don't play there to play there. It's fine. They find it a lot easier to come off the left where they can tuck in on the right foot and slip inside. Mm. It's not natural for them on that on that wing. And so I thought he was given a tough gig today um, in terms of where his natural position is. If you said to Paul Pogba, play any of the three positions in midfield and any of the three positions up front, that's the one he wouldn't pick. That would be the sixth. Um, you know, that would be the sort of lowest of all the positions that he'd select. So I, I, I didn't... Um, criticise him for his performance in the games. I thought it was a difficult gig to get on that right hand side as I have done with Rashford who prefers to play on the left but I do think he can have a big influence on United because he's got confidence he's got arrogance, good arrogance in the sense that he believes in himself he thinks he should be playing in the biggest games in the world he thinks he should be winning the Premier League title and thinking positive thoughts and thinking that you're the best and believing you're the best is a big thing when you're going on to win and I think that for me United they just in that last 20 minutes didn't quite, they just had that little bit of missing belief. I don't know if you thought the same, just that mm. little bit of something that you thought, that's what's missing. And it's not a long way away, but it, that's the bit that will stop them winning the title. Yeah, it was like the Manchester United before Alec Ferguson started winning yeah. the title. Until you do that, and it's a long time, it'll be yeah. eight years this year if they do win it, eight years since the last one. So you can understand that. And, and Liverpool, of course, have got that, having won the title. And probably they approach the last few minutes with a bit more togetherness and certainty that a draw would, would do if it, it turned out that way. Well, I, I, Look, I look at this game and you think to yourself, where can you go from being there to title winners? One thing would be that Manchester United need to push up the pitch a bit more to be up in the game a little bit more. If you look at Liverpool there, even with Fabinho and Henderson, they're up, they're up the gate. You know, the game's mm. well up the pitch. You know, they're playing on the halfway line. You look at Manchester United, they're just playing a little bit deep. I think Michael Richards mentioned it at half-time. They just went a little bit deep. And I think when they come here and play 10 yards further up the pitch, maybe in a couple of seasons or next season when they've got maybe another centre-half in the club that can maybe give them that confidence to do so. At that point, that's when you'll start to see them doing it. The other bit is that right-hand side is emerging. Well, not emerging. It is a problem. There's no doubt. Juan Mata's played there. James has played there. Pogba's played there. Rashford's played there. And I've probably... Van der Beek's played there. Greenwood's played there. That's six players that I can think of, and I've probably missed out some, that have played in that position, and no one's cemented it. And we know that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer wanted that right wing position filled in the summer. He didn't get it, and it's just posing a little bit of a problem, because I think that if there was a goal-scoring right winger in that squad today with Rashford and Martial, and maybe Greenwood could have been the person, but maybe just not quite there yet, that, I think, would be potentially a difference. So a centre-back that gets them up the pitch, that extra 10 yards, and maybe that right winger. There's still a question mark over whether the centre-forwards are good enough, etc. But I think at the moment, they're the two positions I would focus most on. And we know that Liverpool's problems were a goalkeeper and a centre-back, and they got Alisson, they got, um, they got Van Dijk. Manchester United, just that little bit of belief, a couple of extra players. They're not as far away as it looks if Liverpool and City say, stay at this standard and don't jump back up to that 100 points a season standard, which is just, I say, it's, it's incredible that. It's a great result for those who won yesterday and earlier today. Tottenham will to make some ground in this squeezed together concertina league. We don't know what Manchester City have done. They've had some problems with Crystal Palace and yeah. home games in the past. But you saw Tottenham, you watched Tottenham earlier today. Mm -hmm. um, Leicester is a very important win against a very good Southampton side. Chelsea got a win. Um, you know, it, it, is, it, is, it is very different, isn't it? I mean, you've, you, you articulated it beautifully earlier about, about the se last two or three seasons. But really... Um, I can't recall, and, and it's, it is an unprecedented time. We know why there's no crowd. There are more away wins than home wins, which probably never happened before. Yeah. I haven't checked that out, but it seems yeah. unlikely it's happened before. So I think we've got to relish this, haven't we? And, and we re relish the closeness of it all. We have. I think Jamie said something before the game to me. He said, yeah, I've watched Tottenham. He said, and it feels like they've lost every game in the last few weeks. And yet if they'd have won <laughs> earlier in the week, they'd have gone one point behind Liverpool. And today, mm -hmm. and Leicester seems to have not played that well and lost a few games, and yet they've gone second. And it's that type of season. Mm -hmm. Chelsea a few weeks ago were, uh, you're thinking, wow, they're at that level and they lose four or five games. They've just won a game against 10 men and Frank Lampard said, oh, hang on a minute, yeah. we haven't solved all our problems and they go to Leicester on Tuesday. Yeah, and it's just swinging back and forward. Mm. City are dangerous and emerging and just look like the form's good. And if you look at, you've got to look at performance, haven't you? So are Liverpool at the standard? They're not. They're way off it of where they ordinarily have been in this last couple of years. Are Manchester United consistent at the standard? They're getting better, but they're not quite there. 
City in this last couple of weeks just look like they're getting to a level that if they can maintain it, they're going to cause some real damage in this league this year. And I was I was off them about six to eight weeks ago. I thought they looked bored. Their body language was gone. Pep on the sidelines looked less interested. And yet, that, that Chelsea performance at Stamford Bridge, that half an hour was sensational. And it just looked like it brought the whole club to life. And then they went to Old Trafford. So you just think that they're in a really good moment where the confidence is good. But, like most teams this season, it's been short-lived. It's been four or five weeks of that, and then it's been a dip. It's who's going to have that consistent run. But at this moment, I, I've said Liverpool all season. I said Liverpool at the start of the season. But I would transfer it to City now, looking at the way in which City are playing. Liverpool just look like they're not going to get Van der Dijk back quickly. And they just look like things just aren't quite right. And the biggest problem about not getting Van Dijk back it's not just Van Dijk not coming back, it's the fact that they can't get Fabinho then into midfield. They need Jota back as well. And Jota as well, because yeah. obviously then he just gives them that sort of extra presence up front, which mm. would push that front three. So we've got we've got an intriguing league. We've had, I think, an outstanding league in this last couple of seasons in terms of standard, but we've got the most intriguing league where it looks like it could flip from one week to the other, and we want that. I think, to be fair, at this moment in time, the Premier League is providing one of the only bits of respite, along with walking and cycling in the country. Um, another football as well, obviously. Um, it's providing so much uh, entertainment for everybody at home. There's been talk over the last few weeks about whether football should stop, and we, we covered it on the last podcast. It absolutely shouldn't. There then seems to have been this little thing emerging in the last week about goal celebrations, and I'm not quite sure how all of a sudden, after seven months of goal celebrations, goal celebrations have become a problem within bubbles that are tested twice a week. And we've got what would be very very few cases emerging. Um, with no indication that anyone's caught it from another player during a football match. Yeah, and the, you know, you say it just doesn't make sense, but it would seem to me that, you know, I think they said, they said earlier on in the week that government have had a word with the football authorities. If I were the football authorities, I would have told them where to go. The government have used football as a PR and marketing exercise for the last eight months to cover up what would be quite a lot of difficult decisions that they've had to make and at times what would be unpopular decisions. And football is still going because they know that if they remove football at this moment in time, they'll be uproar and they'll have a lot bigger problem than they've already got, which is obviously making you know, the, the, with the country's locked down, which we understand why. So I think at this moment in time, football's doing a very, very good job. The, the, the fact that it's entertaining, that it's swinging from one week to the other is exciting. I like it. I like the fact that my team are back in the mix. But I like also the fact that Tottenham are up there, that Leicester are up there, that Liverpool are dipping a little bit, that City aren't quite where they were a couple of seasons ago. And it looks like anything could happen. City, like I say, are just just sat there. The Manchester City ambassador that we have in our studio at half time, <laughs> I could just see him sat there just smirking. All the Liverpool and Manchester United rivalries emerged in this last few days and he's just sat there thinking, I know what's going on here. We're Mike, doing all right. We're playing well. <laughs> Mike has got his mojo back. <laughs> he has. He's just sat there. He's uh, Foden looking. I mean, I, I'm going to mention Foden because I've got a soft spot for him. Uh, in the sense that uh, he's a local lad. I've been critical of Manchester City not bringing through young players. But he's brilliant. And he's a brilliant player and he's an English player. And I've not seen too many. We talk about, oh, we've not produced a player since Gascoigne that can beat a man with the ball. And he just looks to me like a fantastic football player. And if we don't build around him, you know, in this next few months, I'd be amazed if he's not starring in the European Championships for England. He looks like, to me, he should be right in the team because in that last tournament that you were at over in Russia, you looked at where the problems lay at times. I know we defensively, you know, towards the end, it was a struggle, but also how we connected that back to front through midfield and had someone who could take the ball. He just looks to me like he, he could do that. And obviously Grealish, I think, fits into that category as well. So it's an exciting time. I'm excited about football in a very difficult moment in the country, but the, the, the football watching is good. And even today, the nil-nil, it wasn't a nil-nil. I mean, I was very critical of the Manchester derby mm. six to eight weeks ago. I thought it was awful. And I thought it was unforgivable, actually, that, that both teams put that show on. But this today wasn't like that. It was a different type of game. It was a game where I thought that there was the intent there to win. Just both teams were measured and just knew the risks of, obviously, all the weaknesses, as you described earlier, in the defences. Gary, a positive way to end yeah. the podcast. Thanks for your time. Thank you.